Okay, it's 7.30, so should we start and take roll? Yes. Thank you, Chair Choi. Committee member Breeding? Here. Great. Vice Chair Chen? Here. Committee member Larson? Here. Committee member Merchant? Here. Committee member Peterson? Here. Great. Committee member Willie? Here. Chair Choi? Here. Great. Okay, right. um, does anyone have any questions or comments about the minutes for last month's meeting? And I'll apologize again. Sorry, they came out a bit late. My uh, computer ate them. So <laughs> um, thanks for thanks for your patience. I had to uh, recraft part of the minutes. Um, and then again, thank you for your patience. Again, when I resent them today, I realized I was spelling committee member Woolley's last name incorrectly. So if I ever spell any of your names incorrectly, feel free to uh, let me know. Okay, if there's no questions, could we have a motion to approve the minutes? Oh, real quick, I just noticed that we had a member of the public raise their hand. Hi, good evening, everybody. Just real quick, regarding the minutes, I know everything's online. I was just wondering if maybe the minutes could be posted somewhere at public places or at kiosks um, on Solano, maybe at the library or some sort of familiar locations in Albany, maybe telephone poles on Solano or light poles. We can have little uh, billboards or signs somewhere installed. Um, that way the public could be more aware of the minute the minutes if they don't have you know access to you know wi-fi or a laptop or a computer or cell phone or smartphone to do that sort of thing or just more transparency you know just um you know the agenda the minutes everything you know more awareness public awareness uh certain key places so people could see it thank you Okay. Um, now, could we have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second. And could we have a vote call? Vote. Yes. Committee member Breeding? Yes. <laughs> Vice Chair Chen? Aye. Committee member Larson? Aye. Committee member Merchant? Yes. Committee member Peterson? Yes. Committee member Woolley? Yes. Chair Choi? Yes. Okay, motion passes, minutes approved. Um, now, if anyone from the public has any comment on something that's not on the agenda, they can speak now. Don't see any hand raised, but we'll give it another five seconds. All right. Jeremiah, you're allowed to talk. I'm sorry, was this uh, regarding public comment? Yes. Oh, okay, great, thank you. You know, I really like that. Um, the meeting started at 7.30 and it's what, 7.34? And now we're already to public comment, you know, something that's not on the agenda, right? Thanks, yeah. Lizzie. Public comment for things not on the agenda. Thanks. Thanks for the uh, feedback. So I really appreciate that because it makes it easier for families at home or people who want to talk about something at the meetings because we'll have other meetings in the city and it's agenda item number six. We don't know when that's going to come up, you know, after presentations. So public comment, it's difficult to make public comment. So the way this committee has the agenda set up to where public comment is one, two, or three like this, 
I just want to applaud you and thank you for allowing public comment at 734. I appreciate that. So that's worth a minute to acknowledge that for sure. Um, so basically, I want to acknowledge also a few other things regarding the situation. Uh, I was recently made aware about some sort of freshwater fish uh, decline in possible rivers or streams in America. I was just wondering if that was any sort, some sort of point of interest to look into. I don't know if it was a good cause regarding some sort of freshwater fish uh, decline or something. I Googled it and it came, it came up with some results. Um, I just want to raise awareness if just to make sure everybody was on the committee up to date about this. Cause I just heard about it. So I was just kind of relaying some information that I heard about freshwater fish. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, maybe I'm, I guess I'm requesting an update. I don't know if, if someone could look into it, please. Uh, some sort of update on freshwater fish for the public to let everybody know some sort of what's going on with the freshwater fish in our streams and, and rivers kind of thing. I think it could be important. Um, I just want to share that with, with everybody in some sort of, if you were interested. Um, so yeah, just a lot of sort of, sort of other things. You know, I, I was doing some investigation. If you're into rainwater collecting and you, you have a tar uh, roof, you know, you might want to get your water filtered or something or water collection might be better on some sort of aluminum or tin roof or some sort of, you know, plastic roof, some sort of roof uh, to where uh, tar rainwater um, doesn't go in some sort of drinking water. You know, if you have a tar, some sort of tar on your roof, you wouldn't want to use that for drinking. So point of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah. Okay, I believe that is all the public comment we have. So back to you, Chair Choi. Uh oh, Chair Choi, we may have lost you. Are you there? It's looking like Chair Choi's Zoom may have frozen. Maybe just have the co chair take over until she's back. I'll give her like 10 more seconds. Chair Choi? All right, lost in Zoom space. Uh, Vice Chair Chen, would you mind uh, chairing until Chair Choi is able to join us again? Yeah, definitely. Hope we get her back. Um, yeah. So the next item on the agenda is announcement from staff and committee members, reports and updates of status on previous agenda items. Great, let me pull that. All right, for announcements today, um, I'll start with sustainability events and resources, our standing item. Uh, we'll give a quick update about what we have planned so far for Earth Day 2021. Uh, and then I realized I forgot to add a reminder about the advisory body training tomorrow. Oh, there we go. <laughs> sustainability events and resources. Uh, given that we are still undergoing a pandemic, the events side has been uh, a little low lately. So I've mostly been focusing on resources. And this month, I'd like to focus on stopfoodwaste.org, which I have mentioned before is a great website. Um, and Stop Waste has invested some uh, time into reaching out to local chefs to provide more um, tips and blog posts that are available on stopfoodwaste.org, all kind of framed around the theme of climate change, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also saving money, saving time, and preparing meals for families. So I encourage you to check that out. ebce.org slash induction will lead you to a new web page on ebce's website that has specifics about induction cooking. ebce has plenty or uh, many other 
web pages that are specific to electric appliances, electric vehicles, but this new page on induction features a new video, again, with a local chef uh, demonstrating how she makes her famous recipe um, from her East Bay restaurant on an induction uh, range. So I encourage you to check that out as well. And then Michelle uh, and I launched the uh, home electrification guide that we've been working on also with an intern and with Bianca Hutner for the past few months. And that is now available if you go to albanyca.org slash electric. And the uh, E! News featured a blurb about the website last week. And according to Michelle, she checked it out and it actually had 60 hits uh, over the weekend. So 60 people uh, viewed our website, uh, which is very exciting. Any questions on that before I move on? Seeing none. Well, I just I just want to say congratulations on that. That's a good milestone and great work, you guys. We're very excited about it. Um, for Earth Day 2021, we are working on partnering with the Watershed Project, which is a local nonprofit that does work on watershed uh, conservation and awareness. And for Earth Day 2021, we may do some kind of, um, there will definitely be an online piece. There may be um, other elements as well that are designed towards um, getting people outside, but on their own schedule. Uh, so it's maybe like a map or something that folks can use to guide a walking tour to learn about watersheds for Earth Day. That's still in development, but we're excited um, to see where that takes us. And then I'll pass it to Michelle. Uh, she attended an, a meeting with Stop Waste yesterday and also is cooking up something exciting of her own. <laughs> yeah, so Stop Waste has actually a whole Earth Week plan that they're putting together right now. And so there's going to be a pretty large variety of online, you know, virtual events that are countywide. Um, and they've, they've got a really nice variety of things. It's still kind of in the works. So I'm excited to see what the final lineup looks like. But um, we're hoping to be involved in that at least a little bit. And then I'm also going to be doing a mending workshop with the Senior Center here in Albany. This is another virtual event. This is actually going to be my third mending workshop. So we've been having a lot of fun and we're going to do a kind of special Earth Day session. What does it mean to do a mending workshop? Yeah, so it's, it's just, um, you know, mending, like mending clothes, sewing, that sort of thing. That's what I thought. I just wasn't yeah. sure. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Michelle. So we're excited for Earth Day 2021. We'll have more information on our website and on social media in the coming weeks. Then uh, as a reminder, tomorrow evening, there is an advisory body Brown Act training. This is mandatory and I promise you, you will want to be there for the whole thing because you will get all your questions about the Brown Act and the, um, the rules and guidelines for being an advisory body member answered at this training. It starts at 4.30 p.m. and should run till about six. Uh, you were sent a link by the city clerk. You should uh, register in advance so that a unique Zoom link can be sent to you. Um, and I think a reminder was sent today. The original email came out on February 18th. If you did not receive any of those emails, please email me and let me know. Any questions? Seeing none, I believe that concludes our announcements. And Chair Choi is back. Um, Chair mm -hmm. Choi, I believe we have a member of the public with their hand raised. Oh, okay. For announcements. <laughs> Jeremiah? Hi, welcome back, Chair Choi. Hey, thank Oh no, Jeremiah, I apologize. I, I accidentally muted you. Oh, everything's okay. Welcome back everybody. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge uh, you were talking about the food and you know, toward the beginning. And I just want to remind everybody there's a wonderful food bank on 9th street and university, the Berkeley food network. 
and there's a whole warehouse uh, full of uh, food and there's a refrigerator, a freezer and shelves with, with re food resources. And if anybody wanted to go and get food, fresh vegetables, very fresh vegetables and a lot of things you need, maybe some milk or cheese or, um, you know, any food, uh, meat, some sort of, uh, or vegetarian, anything. And so I just want to remind everybody that there's food resources out there and there's so much food going around. And if it doesn't get all used, it has to just go in the green at the end of the, the day. So please try to hit up those food banks and give it a shot. You know, it's well worth it. A lot of the food banks are Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Sprouts, donations. So, all right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next up, we have an update on gas powered garden equipment. And just a side note, this is purely for the committee to listen rather than um, begin a discussion because action has already been taken on it. Thank you, Chair Choi. Let me bring up, oh, and I'm starting at the end. <laughs> Let's go back all the way to the beginning. Ask all your questions first. <laughs> Okay, um, so this is our update on motorized garden equipment, specifically leaf blowers. And just to give everyone a little bit of background on uh, the last time this came to the committee, um, last February, staff uh, gave a presentation to the committee about leaf blowers and talked about some of the issues, some of the different um, tactics, different cities have taken to deal with them. The main concerns about leaf blowers are the pollution, the noise, and the air quality. Um, anyone that's been around a leaf blower knows that they smell terrible and they're very loud. And they do um, emit quite a bit of uh, greenhouse gas emissions for their size. So all those things are problems. Um, and you know we definitely want to reduce the numbers of leaf blowers you know, gas leaf blowers that are in use. Um, the committee talked about this and came to the decision not to ban gas powered leaf blowers in the city, but instead to focus on outreach and education. Um, and there are a few reasons behind this decision. One of the big ones is that a ban would be really, really difficult to enforce. Many of the other cities that have put on bans have I mean, they're essentially ineffective. They don't do all that much considering that it's, you know, random people and random places for short periods of time. There was also equity concerns, um, especially related to people that, um, you know, are gardening for a living and the difficulty of getting more expensive equipment and time. And also the fact that leaf blowers are not a huge problem in Albany comparatively. There aren't that many large lawns, pretty small yards overall, and we don't get very many complaints. We probably get about two or three complaints a year from the public. So that's um, why the committee came to that decision. And again, just decided to focus on an outreach and education campaign, which is what Lizzie and I have been working on. Um, so we've developed a few things. I'm just going to kind of go through and show you what, you what we've developed. So this is our leaf blower flyer, not fire. Um, and I, I won't you know, zoom into all the details here, but as you can see, it's got kind of those three sections where it talks about you know, the issues with pollution, air quality, with noise. And then we have a large section on alternatives telling people to try out electric or rakes, you know, the good old fashioned rake and also lawn sweepers, or just leaving leaves where they are, letting it become mulch, as well as some resources. And this is the base for a set of um, smaller pieces of information that we've been putting on the e-news and also on our social media pages on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. So this is an e-news post from January. This has just a little bit about alternatives here. 
here's one from, I think this is Twitter about um, pollution. And then we also have a few that are um, getting ready to go out soon. We've kind of been putting them out every week or so. So um, there are a few coming soon. So it's about noise here. Air, air pollution and air quality and mulching. So just to give you a little sense of uh, what we're doing and all of these will link back to that flyer so people can get all of the details. We also have a brochure that will eventually be printed in City Hall once people are going to City Hall again. <laughs> and that's all, any questions? Yeah, I, I have some, oops, I have some comments on this. And I'd like us to keep this, I'd like it to come up again. So I'll bring it up with future agenda items. But I did look at the um, information that was provided. And one thing I think needs to happen is that the city needs to lead on this. I realize we said we wouldn't do much. I look back at this, especially the, I think it was the 2019 or um, latest, the 2020 memo. And there's a lot, a lot of pushback from public works saying, oh, this is, this will do substantially more effort. And I really question the use of, you know, loaded words like substantial. Um, the leaf blower, you know, I did a little, I've done research on the commercial grade leaf blowers. You know, their operating expenses are less. So over time you save some money, even though you do have to buy them. And I also think even if they blow a little less, um, things don't need to be immaculate. I mean, this whole idea that you need to come in and blow every little shred of stuff out into the street where it just goes to someone else's place is, is not constructive. So I think the city needs to lead on this. And I would like to figure out a way that we can start a pilot plan with public works to get a number of, you know, there's some really good systems. And once you adopt a system, you know, you can get a 50 amp, um, battery system that plugs into various pieces of equipment from blowers to edgers to trimmers to weed whackers um, and move them towards those systems. And I think this would even be a good use of some of the measure DD funds if we wanted to think about how to fund it. Um, but anyway, I, I think the city needs to lead and that's my, my interest on that. I, I don't think just saying, oh, it's gonna be worse that's a very knee-jerk response, and I think it needs to be questioned. I will note, we do have a member of the public with their hand raised, um, so maybe we should do questions, then public comment, and then comments and discussion from the committee. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. Um, so, Michelle, I reviewed the uh, memo from February of 2020 that you distributed earlier. And I was just curious if there are any updates. Uh, there was a section on the memo that discussed whether the California Air Resources Board would be considering new standards for um, small engines. Uh, so I believe that was supposed to happen in 2020, but you know, given that we had a worldwide pandemic, I could see that perhaps that may have slipped. So curious if there are any updates for that. And uh, I was wondering if you could just give sort of a brief explanation of if those standards did evolve, uh, would that imply that Albany would have to tackle this problem anyway and deal with enforcement? Um, that's a great question. I don't actually know if the standards have changed, but I can check uh, and get back to you on that. If they have changed, that means that basically the, the new leaf blowers that are sold would have to follow those rules. So it would be more at the uh, retail level rather than at the city level where that enforcement would happen. Any other questions? Sounds like no. Okay, should we go to the public? One second. Jeremiah? 
Hi, thank you very much. I really appreciate public comment. I was just wondering, was it originally talked of as a ban? I just don't know. I mean, I know what that means. You know, banning something means it's not allowed. But was it referred to some sort of a municipal code? I wasn't sure if this was proposed as a, munis a municipal code for uh, public health because, you know, it's exhaust in the air or something. I don't know. But maybe there is some sort of homeowner, you know, tax rebate, you know, for some sort of discount, or some sort of incentive to upgrade, you know, uh, some sort of rebate. Because if, you, if there's going to be a rule, you can't have these anymore. Now you can only have these electric ones. Well, someone is going to have to buy one now, go to Home Depot and go buy a new electric uh, you know, some sort of electric edger or trimmer or some sort of whacker and upgrade, but maybe there's some sort of rebate or discount if the homeowner or some sort of renter um, wants to follow the rules and, and go with the flow, then there should be some sort of incentive. You know, maybe there's a an edger giveaway day or trimmer giveaway day, you know, or some sort of whacker giveaway day um, to where if you do some sort of community service or something, you know, get so many hours, you know, or, or you keep going to cert or something, you know, you get an edger, you know, some sort of, some sort of a action kind of group sort of thing. So I don't know if there's some sort of incentive for some sort of because it's just going to cost people money. You know, the more rules we make, the more laws and we make, it's going to keep costing people more and more money. Um, but it's going green. I get it, you know, um, but it's going to cost everybody. Everybody's going to have to buy a, an electric tool, right? So um, got to get in line for that, you know, at Home Depot, because everybody's going to be getting in line for that, right? So um, we're standing in line all day for an electric tool. But um, so I don't know, maybe some sort of certified, if you can get your equipment, your gas powered equipment certified, you know, by Albany Public Works or something that the filters change, everything's running good, you know, that it passes some sort of smog or something, some sort of, uh, I don't know, small appliance smog control cer certification, some sort of sticker where let's say a lawnmower, you know, would, would get a smog test at some sort of appliance store or something, some sort of California smog, small appliance smog, lawnmower smog. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremiah. Um, and yeah, to get back just to the original question you were asking at the beginning there about the ban, that was one of the things on the table last year. And then, like I said, the, the CAC at that point decided not to pursue a ban. Um, I don't think we talked about any of those options you were talking about there about, you know, incentive programs at the time. Um, but yeah, there are different levels of bands that were brought up. I don't see any other members of the public with their hand raised. Okay, then um, now we just have, or it's item 6-1, which is a quick discussion on adjusting the meeting times. Oh, yeah, just to write, rewind real quick, though, I think um, we wanted to provide an update today about what we've done thus far, uh, noting how many things we had on the agenda, though, we didn't want to dive into a date, we can put that as on as a future agenda item. Um, but considering, or, you know, considering the timing tonight, we just wanted to provide an update so the committee could discuss if it's something that they want to agendize for a future meeting. I'll, I'll agree with committee member Peterson that I would also like to see it addressed at a future meeting. Any other comments uh, or questions before we move on? All right, back to you, Chair Choi. Okay, so now moving on to agenda item 6-1. Perfect. 
All right. Um, so do you have a slide? <laughs> Although it's not all that helpful, I will put it, pull it up. Okay. Um, this evening, we want to ask the committee if the committee would like to discuss changing the official start time of climate action committees to seven o'clock. Currently, the CAC starts uh, officially at 7.30 p.m. and we ask that everyone join us online around 7.15, 7.20. Um, but we are now the latest committee in the city to start. Uh, so we thought we'd bring it to the committee to discuss if we want to now start a half hour earlier at seven. It's also up to the committee to discuss what official end time the committee would like to have, noting that um, the advisory body handbook uh, and general city policy recommends that meetings don't go longer than 2.5 hours. Um, so following that guidance, the official end time would be 9.30 p.m. Uh, and then any extension beyond the official meeting end time would be okay, but would have to be confirmed by a motion. Typically, what we've been doing is we start at 7.30, the meeting typically, or technically ends at 9.30 and the committee extends past 9.30. What we're proposing is start at seven, have an official end time of 9.30 and have to approve a motion beyond 9.30, aiming to um, keep the meeting end time closer to its established meeting end time, uh, just to make sure that we're keeping a good time uh, to allow folks to not have to be online the whole evening uh, and to make sure we're keeping our conversations productive because uh, I think Jeff has said it before when meetings tend to go on too long um, some or too late into the evening the discussion can tend to get um, a little repetitive just because everyone's getting tired. All this considered I uh, pass it back to the committee for questions if there are any and if not I do see a member of the public with their hand raised but any questions on this? No questions, we will open it up to public comment. Oh no, <laughs> some technical difficulties. Jeremiah. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I'm all for whatever your committee agrees with you know, it works with everybody's schedule and everything and timing. Um, I just always want to reach out for the public, you know, using public comment, right? Speaking for the public, um, some sort of notification um, outreach. So maybe when the, if this policy changes, maybe that we can implement a policy to where five minutes before the meeting, um, you know, the committee can send out a reminder email, like, okay, the meeting starts in five minutes or something. Um, I mean, I know we get the meet email three hours before and a day earlier or an hour before or something. Um, I was just saying it would be nice for like, you know, a two minute warning at least, you know, two minutes. Okay. It's on right now. And then, you know, you could just flip to the zoom and just um, log on to it. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. And also, you know, some sort of public public outreach to let the public know um, it's being changed. So, that means public comments going to be really 7.04, 7, 7 o'clock. Maybe that could be posted somewhere for people to see. Um, you know, I know it's a new thing. I know it's kind of every committee is kind of doing it right now, moving their, moving these city meetings and half an hour earlier. I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, wow. I mean, I don't know. I just, I just really think that there needs to be more awareness because people are going to start showing up at 7.30, maybe, maybe at 7.30 if, if new people come in the, the meeting that you notice, you know, as, as commissioners, you notice, hey, well, someone logged on at 7.30 and they come on trying to do public comment and they naturally forgot or something and they don't normally speak and would have no idea. Maybe you would at least let them speak public comment you know, let there be a second public comment allowed, you know, you could have a public comment agenda item three, 
and agenda item number, you know, 10 or toward the end, you know, between future agenda items and, you know, new business or something. Um, you could take a, a public comment right at the last minute, you know, if someone logged on late or something at 7.30 and just didn't know, you know, they didn't get the email or they didn't get the notice, the public notice that was everywhere, right? <laughs> I don't know, some sort of public notice that would be everywhere to let every, everybody know um, the update of the new time change. And I wish everybody luck with the new time change. And um, yeah, thank you very much for all the updates. Thank you. Great. No other members of the public with a hand raised. So back to you, Chair Choi, for committee discussion. Okay. Um, if anyone has anything to say, and speak. Uh, committee member Larson is unmuted. Committee member Larson. Oh, you're okay. unmuted. So I think we thought you were oh, sorry. going to say something. No, no, no. Sorry. Our mistake. Yeah, I guess I like the idea of changing the time to seven. Looking at the Albany events calendar, it seems like most committees, seven is like pretty standard. Um, so I'm super supportive of this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is anyone especially opposed to changing the time to seven? Uh, if that's the case, I'd love to put forward a motion to change. I, I guess the, I would, oh. the only thing I would add is that maybe we should discuss if we want to extend it, to, you know, the, keep the two hours or like Lizzie said, some you can go up to two and a half hours is sort of what their recommended guidelines are, right? some like, but I, I guess I'd be in favor of keeping it at two hours in order to try to make a efficient meeting where I don't think that more time necessarily leads to better discussion sometimes. So just throwing that out there. So I, I guess I would say I'm okay with moving it to seven, but I would propose keeping it at two hours. So 7 p.m. start time, 9 p.m. official end time. So is, uh, do we need a motion or is that just a modification to member Chen's motion or we'll you make a motion? And I think the, the motion would be to establish a start time of seven and an end time of nine. So that motion was made? Yeah, I, I would like to make that motion. I second. All right. Um, committee member Breeding. Uh, aye. Vice Chair Chen. Aye. Committee member Larson. Aye. Committee member Merchant. Yes. Committee member Peterson. Yes. Committee member Woolley. Yes. Chair Choi. Yes. Great. Record that. Motion carries. We will start next month at 7 p.m. I will send many reminders. <laughs> Great. All right, back to you, Chair Choi. Okay. Um, so now we have, or item 6-2, which is an update on the East Bay Community Energy. Great. Great. Um, so for members of the committee who were with the committee in 2020, some of this will just be background or things you've already heard. For new members, this may be new information. It's a lot to absorb. Um, so I encourage you uh, to save your questions and ask me any and all questions you have at the end. I will let you know in advance that I don't know if I can answer all questions because it's still a moving target, but um, I will try my best. 
So East Bay Community Energy, for some general background, which was in the memo too, is our community choice aggregation that provides clean electricity to Alameda County residents. So CCAs, when they come in, they procure electricity in lieu of PG&E procuring that is electricity, but PG&E still is responsible for billing and or, uh, servicing and maintaining the service lines. Uh, EBCE is also not involved at all in gas transmission, that is PG&E's realm. So once EBCE was established, council officially joined EBCE in 2016, and then in 2018 enrolled all Albany residential, commercial industrial, care fear medical baseline, and municipal accounts in Brilliant 100. And Brilliant 100, as it was then, is the same as it is now, which is 100% carbon-free energy at price parity to PG&E's standard rates. And then in late 2018, all accounts in Albany started receiving this electricity. Also a note on CCAs, um, at any time, individual customers can choose to change their default product. So even though Albany City Council voted to put all accounts on Brilliant 100, at any time, any account holder could opt up to a higher, more sustainable level or opt down to a lower tier or they could opt out and return to PG&E's customer base. I think one more thing to note that's unique about CCAs and different from investor owned utilities such as PG&E, the revenue that EBCE gets from rates is reinvested back into the community with their local development business plan or other projects uh, that they fund throughout the county. Just some background there. Fast forward a couple years to 2020, EBCE staff announced to the EBCE board that Brilliant 100, which is Albany's default product for all accounts, is a money losing product, which means that it costs more to procure and maintain the status of the product than it is recouping rates by customers paying those rates for it. Um, based on a discussion the board had about their budget for the next fiscal year, they decided to initiate discussions about changing the Brilliant 100 product. The changes proposed to Brilliant 100 were either to one, eliminate it, two, maintain it as a money losing product, or three, maintain it, but, or sorry, yeah, two, to maintain it um, as a money losing product. I apologize, it was those two options. Get rid of it or maintain it as a money losing product. The board also discussed uh, exploring options of new electricity mixes. One of those was an option that was proposed that would be a 100% carbon-free product, similar to Brilliant 100, but to contain nuclear power. Um, and it would be at price parity to PG&E. And that nuclear power would be nuclear power that EBCE would buy from PG&E from the Mount Diablo Canyon, or sorry, the Diablo Canyon um, nuclear power plant that is supposed to sunset in the next few years. So it would have been a temporary electricity product. Ultimately, the um, board did not consider this product. Um, once a larger city voted that they were not interested in adopting this product, EBCE decided to pull the product from consideration for the 2021 product offerings. Then, uh, as I mentioned, the EBCE board discussed providing Brilliant 100, but with a subsidy, which would mean that Brilliant 100 would remain for one more year. Uh, but in order to recoup those, or I guess to fill in the gaps of where Brilliant 100 was a money losing product, EBCE would subsidize it by revenue gained from ratepayers paying for Bright Choice and Renewable 100. They also changed the discount on the Bright Choice product, which is the lowest tier, um, from a 1.5% discount to PG&E rates to a 1% discount to PG&E rates, and that took effect also December 31st, and they made no changes to Renewable 100. Um, so I guess I should back up just a tad uh, and share that for 2021, ultimately what was available to uh, customers of EBCE and to cities 
were Bright Choice, which is a 1% discount to PG&E, and around 86%, at least in 2020, carbon-free. And carbon-free is both renewable resources and large hydropower. Um, sorry, <laughs> renewable resources, carbon-free resources, which are hydropower, and then also some non-clean electricity in that bright choice power mix. Brilliant 100, 100% carbon-free, large hydro and renewable, price parity to pg &E, and renewable 100, which is 100% uh, renewable energy, California-generated solar and wind, offered at around a 10% premium to pg &E's rates. So in September of 2020, we came to the CAC and the CAC made a recommendation to the city council based on the options available, um, which the council would then uh, consider. So this is kind of, this is where it may get a little bit confusing. So bear with me and if you have questions, please write them down. At the time that we were asked to make a decision about what default product Albany both the Climate Action Committee wanted to recommend to the City Council and that the City Council would choose for Albany's default product for 2021. It was not yet clear what concrete, what options would be available. So we were asked to create a ranked choice list so that whichever choice appeared first that was available on that list, that would become Albany's default. The Climate Action Committee, based on this, created the list you see before you, which was to first keep all accounts on Brilliant 100 if the product remained available and was subsidized, meaning that as long as the product wasn't eliminated uh, and didn't get a rate increase, we would keep all accounts on that product. The second choice, if number one wasn't available, would be to place all accounts on the potential nuclear option. And then if the nuclear option was not available, this third choice would take effect which is placing residential customers on Renewable 100, commercial industrial customers on Bright Choice, municipal customers on Renewable 100, and CareFira Medical Baseline customers on Bright Choice. So, um, spoiler alert, uh, our first option ended up being available. So all accounts across the board, CareFira Medical Baseline, commercial industrial, and residential accounts remained on Brilliant 100. The council did vote to opt all municipal accounts into Renewable 100, which is the 100% renewable at a 10% premium. So the council voted to basically adopt the CAC's recommendation. That was the list that was sent to EBCE. And again, our first option, which was to keep all accounts on Brilliant 100 and opt up municipal accounts was uh, passed. Then the EBCE board voted, as I mentioned, to maintain Brilliant 100, but decided that Brilliant 100 would sunset on December 31st, 2021, which means that the cities, including us and also Hayward and Pleasanton, who currently have a default option of Brilliant 100 for customer categories, must pick new default products by the end of June 2021 to take effect on January 1st, 2022. Currently, the options that are available to choose from are Bright Choice, which I, again is around 80% carbon free, available at a 1% discount to PG&E, and Renewable 100, which is 100% renewable at about a 10% premium to PG&E, and as EBCE calculated, calculates it for a average household, so residential customers, it's about $4 per month extra on the electricity bill. EBCE staff has stated that they will not explore adding any other product offerings to the list above unless a board member explicitly requests one. There is a board meeting tonight um, happening at the same time as our meeting, so I'm not sure if this has happened yet, but as of when I created this presentation, um, that had not been brought to the table. So a few, I guess, um, what will happen, uh, as I mentioned in the memo, next steps are for the committee uh, either next month or the month after to make a recommendation as it did to council, uh, as it did last year to council stating which default product or products for different customer categories the CAC would like Albany's default to be. Um, a few things to consider though, since we're about a month out of making that decision. Um, I think when we 
discuss or when the committee discusses what they would like to do, a few things to consider are equity. How will decisions impact low income, those care fear and medical baseline customers uh, and or local businesses? Sustainability, how will our decisions impact our greenhouse gas inventory, both in the short term and, and in the long term? Um, and also that there is a new policy, a proposed policy going to the board this evening. Again, I don't know the outcome yet because the board meeting hasn't concluded yet. But this new policy is that each jurisdiction gets two opportunities annually to have their council make changes to their default products. So there will be an opportunity, a window of opportunity every fall and a window of opportunity every spring. And they ask that councils make a decision and that decision will take effect six months later before again, they open that new next window. Meaning that a city could change its default product every year, twice a year. However, EBCE uh, is also proposing a policy in which EBCE as um, an entity will only cover the costs for operational adjustments and customer notifications about a switch for the first change a jurisdiction makes to its default products, unless that jurisdiction is forced to make a decision because a product is going away. So translated, what that means for Albany is it, we pretty much get a free pass this time around at changing our default product because EBCE um, is taking away our current default. So they should cover at least a portion of the cost um, for making that change. But then we, from what, how I interpret it, we have one other opportunity to make that change. And then any time after that, the city will be responsible for the costs that are incurred for switching over default products. One more thing I realized I skipped over is in December, the EBCE board voted to commit to 100% clean energy procurement for all products by 2030, meaning that EBCE is hoping that every single one of their products available to customers is 100% greenhouse gas free by 2030. So I mentioned next steps earlier, but to reiterate in April or May, uh, we will bring this back to the Climate Action Committee to make a recommendation to council um, for a default product based on the available product offerings, which would take effect January 1st, 2022. The Climate Action Committee may recommend and council may choose different products for different customer categories, meaning that the Climate Action Committee and the council can choose different products for different groups of customers. And those groups are broken down by care, fear, medical baseline customers, commercial and industrial customers, residential customers, and municipal customers. But municipal, as I mentioned, is already opted up to 100% renewable. Um, and I, unless the committee has a change of heart, I'm not sure they will choose to change that. Um, and again, decisions will take effect on January 1st, 2022. And because I just gave you a ton of information, I thought maybe this will help um, if you wanna take a look at it for a second. These are the 2021 product offerings that are currently offered by EBCE, Renewable 100, Bright Choice, which are currently the only options expected to be available for 2022. This middle option, Brilliant 100, is what we currently have for all accounts, except for Municipal, and it will be sunsetting on December 31st. So I'll give you a few more seconds to take a look at this. And now I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you all. Great. Any questions? And I know that was a lot. So thank you for bearing with me. Questions? I had one question. So this is just setting the default plan for each of these individual categories of customers, and then individual customers could opt for a different plan or even to go back to PG&E if they wanted. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the city can choose a default. So all customers who are currently within EBCE can opt up or down based on city decisions. If they don't like that decision or they just wanna change themselves, they can opt up or down or 
out to PG&E again. Hey, Lizzie. Mm -hmm. um, the chart you just showed is, is, is helpful. Um, could you add PG&E to that so that we know when we make a decision yes. what, we're, you know, what our implications are as far as are we you know, sort of incentivizing people to go back to PG&E um, for a you know, slightly dirtier program that's much cheaper, for example, something like that. So. Yes, um, I can absolutely add that. I can share right now um, that at least last year when the committee discussed this, PG&E had their standard rate, which was again, equal to Brilliant 100. Um, and PG&E's power mix was actually, I believe, 100% carbon free. Uh, because it included that large allocation of nuclear power. Um, but I am I would have to go back and check on that, But um, and I will look to see what it is now, but that's where it was last year. Uh, one thing I want to clarify or just get better understanding of, Pleasanton is a new territory to EDC, correct? And they're being asked to change their default product already? Yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so um, their uh, sustainability folks over there have got their hands full. <laughs> uh, yes, they will also, they enrolled in EBCE, began receiving power from EBCE in January, Brilliant 100 power, and now they will have to choose a new default product. Nick? So I think you answered my question. We have we don't need to make any decision right now or pass any motion. This is just informational, but this will come back on a future agenda where we will be able to, because I have a lot of comments on this, but I'm not gonna make them now if we're not doing anything. Yeah, um, this will come back to the committee when we ask to bring a decision. I wanted to provide, again, it, it's last year was a little bit of a roller coaster and for me, I want to provide as much background information as possible so that it's not all brand new to the committee when we ask everyone to make a decision. Um, but I, I do think we, we have an opportunity today if you want to make comments after we take public comment. Um, that way, I mean, the committee is welcome to discuss preliminary thoughts on this after we take public comment. But any other questions? Um, committee member Larson? Yeah, just to confirm that um, EBC is not going to put nuclear back on any of their plans, right? At this point, it doesn't seem. Yeah, I mean, they that. haven't so far, right? They have not so far. Um, and again, unless EBC has said that unless a board member requests that staff look into an, another option to add to the available options for next year, Potentially a board member could ask for that to include nuclear. I don't know. Um, but I would say right now, it does not look like there will be any nuclear content um, in a significant nuclear content in a product offering for next year. Uh, I guess I had two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, I guess, maybe is a little bit specific or in the weeds, but does this affect every single rate code that falls under those categorizations or does it only affect certain rate codes? Uh, and I guess in particular, I'd be really curious if there is any type of change from kind of like the E1 tiered rating to time of use for residential. These are questions I don't know how to answer. <laughs> uh, okay, that's fine. Um, and then I guess my other question was we appear to have like a pretty clear list of uh, prioritized options that were decided in September. Um, is there any reason that we would not simply fall back to that list of prioritized options? Like has anything changed since September? Well, I guess that's the committee's um, opportunity to revisit that list. Um, but the committee is also welcome to defer to that list um, or uh, re-discuss it again. Committee member Peterson. Uh, just to answer that, yes, there are a lot of good reasons, but I don't want to go in it now because it'd be nice to move on. 
So if there are no other questions, we do have a member of the public with their hand raised. All right, we'll move to public comment. Jeremiah. Hi, thank you so very much. You know, I was just listening uh, to you, to everybody speak to, to your presentation and a really nice presentation. I was just thinking to myself, most of them sound really great. You know, it's either the Brilliant 100 or the Renewable. One of them, I think you mentioned it was more hydropower. Was, I think you said 100% hydropower or something. And that was the, you know, Brilliant 100 or something. And the other one was wind. Oh, yeah, you, then you said uh, wind. You know, wind's 100% on this one. And so, okay. But then I'm thinking to myself, I've heard a lot about both of them, you know, the pros and cons, the wind ones, you know, birds kind of run into them because they move so fast and then you can do harm to birds that are just trying to, you know, nest or circulate in the air because these man-made things were developed in the middle of some sort of natural bird habitat zone where they naturally fly anyway. And now it's just some sort of, you know, obstruction in the way. But, um, and hydro, you know, it's, Pros and cons, right? It's it's renewable, but then the fish, you know, it might it might harm some sort of animals because it's a lot of water moving, and there may be some sort of life in the water, and you don't want it to get circulated down some whirlpool, you know. I mean, I wouldn't like going down a whirlpool, you know, and I just don't want to be harmful for other, you know, life on Earth or anything. So, I mean, so far, I mean, what to do, right? It's a catch twenty two wind hydro um i mean i think solar is really good i mean you could just have a solar panel to charge your one you know electric tool or something or but i mean solar i i wish one was 100 percent solar right is it is one of them 100 percent solar and then I hope solar is green. I, I don't think I've heard too much uh, cons or, or negative things about solar. Maybe I have. I just maybe need to be reminded or something. I don't know. I just hope maybe solar is greener or harm, you know, maybe solar harms life less with our man-made energy producing, energy crave society with, you know, all of our electronic devices, you know, and we're creating this energy driven society. We're making all these green adjustments, you know, rules on green powered leaf blowers. I mean, you have to have electric. So where's all this electricity going to come from? So this is a very important topic. And uh, yeah, thank you for all your updates. Please keep providing such wonderful updates. Thank you. All right. No other members of the public with their hand raised. So back to the committee for discussion. Yeah, I guess sort of one thought I had is that if we have a little time before this decision uh, has to be made, like a month or two, I think it would be beneficial to uh, have a little organization around getting community feedback, understanding what you know members of the Albany community would actually prefer, and just having that as an input, especially if we had you know more data on specific groups that would be disproportionately affected, um, you know, like how do uh, small businesses feel about these changes versus, you know, uh, low income communities versus renters versus um, single family homeowners. Uh, so I'd love to get a little bit of feedback on that. And I guess just in general, it's a little bit hard given the information to make an informed decision because it's really hard to tell like how much of an impact each one of these categories affects. So for example, like I have no idea if, you know, the number of kilowatt hours per year used by residential customers in Albany is 10% of the overall kilowatt hours used or 90% of the kilowatt hours used compared to commercial and industrial. Um, so I think given that there's uh, so many different aspects to it, I would actually love to enlist a couple of individuals from the committee to maybe do a little more investigation into this. And I was curious if anyone 
uh, would be interested in forming a subcommittee uh, to explore some of these topics. I'll chime in on that. So um, this has been coming, I mean, this has been an ongoing thing since we got into the CCA in general about does, uh, you know, what is the blend of what we're getting? How is that provided to us? What's really happening? And there's actually a lot of cynical things going on on the side of PG&E, which are pretty upsetting, but I won't go into those. So I, I can put together my knowledge base on this, but I think it would be really time consuming and difficult to, to really do a statistically meaningful um, inquiry. And I think there's a better way to look at this, which is we made a commitment to go the CCA route, which is the right route to go in my opinion, because it removes um, all the profit in electricity from the investor owned utilities who are really just interested in making a profit and not interested in providing clean power, just providing power as cheaply as they can. Uh, if clean power gets cheap enough, then they'll do it. I'm, you know, and so we're, we're kind of in this um, competition to, to convince everybody to go ahead and, and at some points like we did when we made it the default, there's always an out. I mean, even if we make it the default, if people decide that's too expensive for them, they can opt down. And we had very good luck when we went to Brilliant 100, even though people could have gotten, I don't know, one and a half percent less on their electrical power to go to the bright choice. Um, very few people opted out or opted down. I think it was only around four, four to less than 4%. So in just one fell swoop, we made everybody's electricity in Albany much more clean. And I, you know, we need to take those kind of approaches. If, if um, you know, if you try to get every single person to weigh in on this, you're never going to re reach consensus. And we have a lot more knowledge about. I mean, I hate to sound like an elitist or something, but frankly, we've been looking at this for a long time. And the, the complete upshot of it is people just opt out anyway. So I think we need to make the right decision based on what our goals are, and try to convince people that is, and then they can opt out if they don't want to. And I'll, I'll, I'll send Lizzie some, uh, some of my thoughts on this that maybe can be distributed around. Uh, so at least you have the benefit of what, what I'm talking about. Also just a quick comment for council member Chen. I am gonna be doing a presentation pretty soon on a whole bunch of different statistics about uh, emissions and things. And I'm also gonna have some information about electricity use and uh, who's on which plan and all that sort of data for you coming up soon, so. So I don't know where the, um, Daniel Chen, if, or Committee Member Chen, if you wanna bring. Yeah, it seems like there isn't a broad appetite for uh, exploring this. So I guess maybe I'll do a little personal research. Um, Committee Member Chen, Michelle and I can chat, but we might be able to provide you with, like Michelle mentioned those numbers, if if you personally want to do a deep dive into it, I know, um, yeah, I think that would be something we could do. I, you know, I wasn't trying to blow off a good idea. I, there's information you need to know, and I will get it to you via Lizzie. But it's once you understand the situation, it's it's very clear. I think how we need to go, and and when we do actually discuss this, I can explain that even more. Jeff, can you? New things have been coming out. We're we're kind of at a disadvantage because our meeting is one evening before the Brown Act training, but we as staff have been learning a lot more about um, how we should change the things we do. So I'll defer to Jeff. I, I want to make sure. Yeah. That... Um, yeah. I, I hated to interrupt the, the discussion on this, but to, to kind of talk about technicalities of committee member interactions, but um, unrelated to the climate action committee, there's been some communications and some other commissions and committees that are kind of off the, outside of the scope of regular meetings. And the city attorney has kind of weighed in and said, really, 
if if committee members want to communicate with one another, it really should be as part of an agenda um, so that it's it's completely transparent. So if if just if you want to just kind of cover your bases in this particular case, if the two of you want to form a subcommittee that has a telephone conversation or something, that kind of covers the base and and um, and that's perfectly okay. But in the future, if any one of you want to share something with the other members, the protocol and it's not I'm, none of us are really that thrilled about this, but this is what we're we're hearing. The protocol will be. You can send it to us. We'll put it on the agenda for the next meeting and all of you and the public get access to it at exactly the same moment. Um, so it's gonna kind of push a lot of these conversations into the realm of being a subcommittee, even if it's just a very, very brief existence. Um, so um, I think in this particular case, Nick, if you wanna provide that information as part of your action tonight, just form a subcommittee, have the conversation as a subcommittee, then we're good. Well, I'm interested in forming a subcommittee then. Um, <laughs> Thank you. No more than three of us who are interested in this where we can share information directly. And then ultimately everybody else can see it at the next meeting when the subcommittee reports back. Okay, well, I'll make a motion to form a subcommittee on the East Bay Community Energy uh, mix and next steps, which would be myself and member Chan and any, any one other member that would like to join. I'll second the motion. Any other people interested? Looks like it's just us two, that's fine. So just to clarify, the motion um, to form a, um, do we have a name for your subcommittee? The EBCE subcommittee. Okay. Consisting of? Uh, maybe, maybe more generally, can we call it electricity rate subcommittee for 2021? I think that would maybe be more descriptive or electricity rate plan subcommittee? Um, it really has to do with EBCE. I mean, I don't care, whatever, whatever is preferred. Um. That's, I'm fine with that, electricity rate subcommittee. Ele electricity rate subcommittee or rate plan subcommittee? I, I, whatever's more broad. Uh, I think we're talking I, I about the rate that. plan. So yeah, I, I would call it the electricity rate plan subcommittee. Okay. I will now do a vote, roll call vote for the motion to establish the electricity rate plan subcommittee consisting of Vice Chair Chen and Committee Member Peterson. Committee Member Breeding? Aye. Vice Chair Chen? Aye. Committee Member Larson? Aye. Committee Member Merchant? Yes. Committee Member Peterson? Yes. Committee Member Woolley? Yes. Chair Choi? Yes. All right, motion carries. The Electricity Rate Plan Subcommittee established. All right. I had, I had a quick, Michelle, when are you gonna have those figures together? I think for April, uh, but we haven't actually set the agenda yet. So we'll see, but that's my guess. Oh, okay, so if we meet before April, then there wouldn't be a chance to, I mean, there's no way to share that information with the subcommittee. Um, I might be able to, I'd have to check with Lizzie about that, but I might be able to. I think we should, we'll be able okay. to share yeah. the, the electricity data, I think, and Michelle, you can clarify this. We don't want to get your hopes up too much. There's a, a lot of rules, regulations, and attorneys out there protecting and gatekeeping electricity data. So just know that, but we can share what we have. 
If you really want to read something uh, fun, you can go read about the 1515 rule. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> if you can't sleep tonight. Yeah. Great. Okay, back to you, Chair Choi. Yeah, I, I do have a request. If it's possible to get settlement quality meter data from like what's submitted to KISO broken down by rate plan, I think that's like pretty standard as a format. Um, so if it's possible to get that data and share it with the subcommittee, that would be a request. All right, uh, now we have item 6-3, which is an introduction to the city budget budgeting project process for um, Measure DD. Hi, um, so good good evening, everyone. Um, I'm gonna do this presentation. Um, let me just share my screen real quickly. Give me a moment. have a very brief um, PowerPoint just to summarize this for everybody. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, so several meetings ago, um, you, the committee expressed real interest in understanding the city's budget process in particular. I think there was a, um, if not a concern, just some anxiousness to understand how in particular the measure DD funds would be budgeted and make sure that that's done in a transparent process. Um, to refresh your memory, measure DD was approved by the voters last November. It's a utility tax increase on gas and electric, um, as well as a new utility tax on water. And um, at that time, the estimate for additional revenues to the city from these, this new tax of 675,000. And the ballot measure included a statement that there would be an intent to, um, or an endeavor, I think was the word used, to expend one third of those additional revenues, at least one third for additional climate action plan and environmental sustainability programs. So what I'd like to do today is give you um, an overview of what our operating budget is like. And this is kind of generic. It's not necessarily focused in on Measure DD because basically Measure DD is going to be folded into the standard um, budgeting process for the city. So I go, I'm going to have two more slides here just to go through the process a little bit. Um, again, this is generic. This applies to um, nearly all of the, the um, operational programs of the city. So um, first of all, there are two real big pots of money um, that are budgeted by the city. There's the operating budget, that's the day-to-day -day stuff. And then there is a capital improvement program budget, which is um, the, the street repaving and um, sewer lines and storm drains and so forth. Not completely, but mostly construction related. It also includes fire engines and, and other things, things that have a long life, basically. Um, so the way our operating budget is organized, and this is the same with, with nearly all cities, um, it includes both revenues and expenditures, and expenditures are detailed by the type of expense. So you'll see there's payroll, there's benefits, there's operating you know, office supplies, and then there's um, professional services and so forth. You don't necessarily see in the budget numbers themselves how much money is going to be applied to a particular program. Um, the programmatic pro pri priorities are described in, instead in budget narratives that go along with that. So if you're looking at a particular department, you'll see a description of what that department intends to be doing over the next few years. And then there's a budget that, that helps um, uh, accomplish that list of, of objectives. 
And then finally, um, our budget, and again, a lot of cities are doing this, it's a two-year budget. So um, the idea is that it, it um, is prepared once every two years, and we're just beginning that cycle right now. And then during the course of two years, it gets adjusted usually about every six months, at least every year, and typically every six months. So um, as part of the materials that were attached to your agenda, I attached both the original budget that was approved now almost two years ago, back in, in 2019, and the most recent update, which was done actually since your last meeting. It, was a, it went to the city council, um, I believe, in the beginning of March. So that kind of gives you a feel for what they look like. These documents evolve over time. Uh, we have a relatively new finance director. She's been here, I think, a little over two years now. And she has a lot of ideas that she wants to incorporate into this new budget. So I, I think it's going to get better and more descriptive. Um, nonetheless, I hope what we've attached kind of gives you some feel for what it looks like. Um, and then the preparation process. This is um, probably where you're, you're most interested is how, how to influence the outcome of the budgeting planning process. And um, I think it's, it's certainly something that you can begin to talk about, if not now, at a future meeting. But it really, the focus is going to be at a study session that the city council will be holding in a few months. Um, where we start with is that the finance department, internally within the finance department, the staff there, starts to make some projections. Um, they look at what they think is going to be available at the end of the year. And, and I should say by year, I'm talking about fiscal years. So our fiscal year starts in, on July 1st and ends on June 30th. So about now, they're, they're beginning to get a pretty good idea of how much money is going to be left um, in, in different funds on, on June 30th. They also um, will begin the process of projecting revenues for the next couple of years. They have different resources available for doing that. And then also making some estimates of the, the known costs, the, or not necessarily fixed costs, but the, typically if, if we continue with, say, present staffing levels, what are the payroll and benefits going to be? And a big, big chunk, I think, in most cities, I'm not exactly sure what it is in ours right now, but it's probably 75% of our operating budget is, is payroll and benefits. There are other known fixed costs. There's... There's, you know, we can project what utilities are going to be, um, you know, lease payments and so on and so forth. Those are things that are pretty well known. And those are, are uh, estimated and form the foundation for um, a, a first shot internally of working through what's left to work with. Um, and then each department works with the finance director, the city manager to say, OK, here are the things that we want to accomplish in the next two years. This is our estimate of what it's going to cost. And that's obviously an iterative process. Um, we um, usually go kind of two rounds on something like that over the next couple of months, eventually leading to a, a budget study session with the city council. I would guess late May, early June is, is typically when that comes together. And it, it may not be completely baked at that point, but there's a pretty good notion of what the what the issues are going to be and what the tough decisions are going to be. The city council gets then to give us some direction. Um, and I think it's at that point, we'll have a draft budget where um, you'll be able to see how those measure DD funds are being used. And you can, you can make a recommendation to the city council about that one way or the other, whether you like it or you don't like it. Um, even before that draft budget becomes available for you to look at, I think you can begin to th assume that one third of these revenues, something in the neighborhood of 200,000 or so at least, would be um, available for some of the initiatives that are in the climate action plan and, and other things that you're interested in doing. And it's and certainly appropriate for the committee to begin to think about, in fact, I'd highly recommend that you have an idea of what's most important, what you think will be most compelling to the city council so that when they're in, having their study session, they they have something that they will feel um, that is important to, to make sure that they allocate those funds to, um, to the initiatives that you want to support. Um, you know, this, we're going through a period of time that is um, kind of economically uncertain. I don't think that we're by any means in a fiscal crisis. 
Um, if we were in a fiscal crisis where, um, and again, we're not, but if we were, there would be the, the legal ability for the city council to decide we're not going to put money into some of those initiatives right now. We have other core business that we absolutely need to keep going, keep the lights on. You know, the public safety stuff is generally considered the core core business of the city. And that um, in that case, they might choose not to do that. I don't think that we're there um, in, in everything that I've seen, at least so far for this fiscal year and the upcoming fiscal year. Um, and certainly with the work that's that the, the Biden administration is doing in recent weeks um, helps. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near that kind of a crisis, but I just felt like I, I should let you know about that. So I'm going to stop my um, screen share and um, uh, be happy to answer any of your questions. And then, um, of course, we'll take public comment as well. And then you can get into discussion. Yes, uh, um, committee member Larson. Uh, I noticed that the um, the proposed budget for this last session was um, in you know a positive, and then we're are actually in a deficit. Does the city run in a deficit normally, or is it normally run in a positive, or what's the policy on deficit spending? Yeah, so that's something the finance director is working on. Um, as I understand it right now, you're right. You, you observe correctly that the budget is in deficit. So the budget estimated amount of revenues and the allowed amount of expenditures are in deficit. I think at the moment our actuals are not in deficit, um, but I'm, I'm kind of hearing that secondhand. So, um, um, but it, you know, it is, it is um, a reality that some years are good years and other years are bad years. And we, adjust accordingly. And so, yeah, that we can have situations where we run a deficit. Um, we do have a reserve policy. I believe it's that we never go below um, uh, 25%. We keep a reserve of 25% of our operating budget, kind of the rainy day fund. Um, and I think we're well above that, but that's an absolute minimum that we don't want to go anywhere close to that. And that's to get us through something worse than a pandemic. Um, um, because so pretty well. Can I just clarify? I mean, this is obviously an extraordinary year. So, um, is it typical that the city would be running a balanced budget? We strive to. So we're not like the federal government of like expecting to run deficits every year, right? Right. right. That's correct. That's correct. We do not want to do that. Um, you, our neighbors to the north, El Cerrito, have been doing that and they're in a world of hurt right now because of that. So um, um, that's that's not a really great practice. Thanks. Uh, committee member Peterson. Yes, I just, I, I, I looked. Oh, you just muted yourself, Nick. Yeah, apparently when I go to a different application, permanently unmute myself. Um, let me know if I go away again. Um, but I, I was looking at uh, some of the information you shared. I'll try to get it back up again. And I just wanna make sure, cause I, there was some concern. You can still hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, so there was some concern um, and I'm looking at the memo that says uh, City of Albany City Council agenda staff report for amend the amendment of the second year. Um, and looking at the comments there, it says um, revenues, taxes increased uh, at an estimated 193,000. Then we got the increases on a water tax and all that, which is, supposed to, is pushing 700. Plus uh, the real property transfer tax, another 150,000. Also property taxes were up 25,000. And then sales taxes, it says collections are coming in higher than expected. Um, so, and there was actually, you know, under sustainability impact, it said several of the project and program included in the biennial budget aimed to accomplish city council strategic plan goals and other policy initiatives adopted by the city council to further environmental sustainability. So I guess we already have funds in place. So it looks like, if I understand all this right, we're sitting really good and we should 
this year start getting the Measure DD funds if, if the council holds true to the recommendations of the voter? It, by the, the fiscal year that we're currently in, 2021, um, I think the idea right now is to just hold what we're getting right now. And that would be um, in one of the fund balances that they project. And we start the new year in July 1st with something in the neighborhood of, what'd she say, 193,000? Uh, you know, some portion of that would be allocated to to the sustainability measures. Yeah, I, well, I'm, I guess I'm kind of talking both budget, um, this the end of this two-year budget and the beginning of the next, because, I mean, possibly we, we need to wait, but, you know, we're going to be coming forward with proposals on how to use the DD funds. We just want to make sure it sounded earlier when when, you know, there was this budget deficit concern and the pandemic impact on um, tax base and all sorts of other things was was going to mean the city was in a, in a very tenuous financial situation. But it sounds like once we establish this next two-year budget, it looks like those funds that are coming in through Measure DD can be used as recommended uh, to in, in an, an endeavor to fund uh, climate action and adaptation plan actions. Um, I certainly hope so. I, you know, internally, I, I'll be advocating for that. I'm sure you will too. Um, I think long term, I, I do believe that municipal governments are are under some pressure. Um, um, you know, first of all, with respect to the pandemic, uh, the city of Albany is because of the nature of our business mix. Um, we're doing much better than many many cities. Um, I think we have. Um, our drop in sales tax was less than any other city in Alameda County, mainly because we have we don't have a lot of like shopping mall kinds of of retailers. Um, our big retailers are the, the the ones that are doing well, the Target and Safeway grocery stores and so forth mm -hmm. are doing pretty well actually. Um, and we don't have hotels. If you're in one of the city the cities near SFO that rely on on hotel taxes, they're under in crisis. So. As it turns out, as it evolves and as information has become available to us in the last few months, we're feeling a little relieved about that. Um, but the long-term issue of municipal government fiscal health is, and the long-term risk is this overwhelming pension obligation that um, is unfunded. And um, um, that will, that's, the, that's just a big beast that's that's out there. And um, I don't know that anybody has a real good idea of what the long-term implications are, but I think that's that's what we have to worry about. Yeah. Well, kind of reason I bring this up um, is that I, I wouldn't, I have two concerns. One is if, if the budget was really tight, um, then the budgeting would be worked out so that DD funds that were on top of what were already available, I mean, these new funds coming in, would just be used to cover what used to come out of general funds to, to do sustainability efforts when the intent was to supplement what's already happening. So it wouldn't want to see it like how they did the um, lottery reef funds for K through 12, where you know they gave them those monies, but then it was just shoved out of the budget to somewhere else. Um, so, you, you know, we're going to be pushing really hard to, to use yeah. those funds and make effective use of them for climate action adaptation plan actions. And from what, just what I'm saying is, you know, I get a little worried. If, um, if I may just interrupt, why don't we have, make sure there isn't any public comment and make sure, get the question part finished up and then we can do. Sure. Okay. Sorry. Discussion. Yeah, so I think, I think you have kind of, I mean, I haven't gotten the answer I wanted. You're sort of hedging yourself, but it sounds like we're sitting better than we thought we would a few months ago. I would say so. Yeah. Okay. Thank I'm you. not the finance director, but I'm I'm feeling, as the community development director and somebody who tries to pay attention to this, I'm feeling better about it than I was a few months ago. Let's put it that way. Committee member Larson. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, Will the DD funds be a specific line item in the budget the revenue? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
I'm, I don't have a view of the participant or the um, attendees. I don't know if there is a member of the public who wishes to direct the speak or not. I don't see a hand raised, but at this time, uh, if there are no more questions, we can open it up to public comment. So if any member of the public does have a comment, you can raise your hand. Give me a couple seconds. All right. Oh, do member I do see Jeremiah's hands. Yes. Jeremiah. Thank you very much. I just want to say really quick that you did a wonderful job just now saying uh, announcing public comment is about to begin, you know, for myself to be aware and have time to press the button and so, sort of thing. Um, you know, Mr. Bond, you said, uh, should we open a public comment? So I heard that. And then you said public comment again. Uh, what a, what a good model. What a good good job you just did on allowing public comment. You know, you made it aware a few times. So I just want to just say, keep up the good work on keeping these open for public comment. Thank you. No other members of the public with their hand raised. All right. Back to the committee for discussion. Uh, yeah, so just sort of as a point of order, um, I do think it would be beneficial for us to just think about how we want to do this measure DD planning. It sounds like we do want to get a couple of ideas around programming and uh, sort of get that going. So rather than focus on any specific ideas, um, I'm kind of curious if anyone on the committee has ideas for how we can sort of solicit feedback and then have a future agenda discussion on those specific items. Um, yeah, if we're if we're talking right now in the realm of, of just general themes of, of how we should spend this money, I've been thinking for a long time, um, we should uh, focus our efforts somewhat on things that will be very visible and obvious things, things that the public can readily see that can then be used as like a, like a, a campaign slogan, let's say for, for continuing uh, this kind of utility tax. So, so things that are very visible, like urban forestry or, or stuff that with flashy statistics that we could, that we could roll out saying we help this number of people uh, install, I don't know, charging points. I, I, not to get into specifics, but, but stuff that is highly visible. That would be uh, my priority. I don't know what anybody else's thoughts are. I, I'd like to chime in on the three. I agree. Although I, I wouldn't say they're flashy or high profile. I think they need to be effective and demonstrate to the voter, you know, the voters who pass this bill that act, real things are happening that have real impact on climate change. So um, I, when we get to the work plan section, um, the, the comments I've made on that specifically address the measure DD usage. So I don't know if we, is that something we need to do in this part? This was more clarification how the budget will work. I'm, I'm sort of satisfied Jeff said, yes, it looks like the DD funds, we're gonna be able to have comment on them. I, you know, I had a little concern where it said that some stuff would happen internally and it all goes to city council. And then at a city council meeting, we can make a comment. I'd rather be able to make comments internally to staff and budget people about whether we, how we see the DD funds being, being done before it goes right before the city council. So that's what I'd like to see happen. Um, a committee member Larson, I think is. Yeah, um, committee, member, committee member Chen. Um, my perspective is that um, the the climate action plan that we already have adopted has a lot of good ideas in there, a lot of good programs, a lot of good initiatives. <clears throat> that a lot of it is not was not funded, and now we have funds. So I think that'd be that's where I've been looking for the first place for you know what should we 
prioritize for implementation. So I think there's a lot of really good things we came up with in the climate action plan. So I just encourage all of us to remember that that's our sort of, you know, the, 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 the established guideline that we already have. Um, so certainly we can think of new things, but um, just like to remind us that, that that's our established plan already. And now we have funds to, to actually do stuff. So let's, let's go do it. Uh, yeah, I guess a question for Jeff. You mentioned that uh, it seems like the primary input for the planning process is the study session for the budget. Um, when does that occur? It's uh, usually when the finance director feels like it's to a point where it, it's ready to go. Um, ideally, I think it's late May. Um, my experience is that there's usually kind of a crunch at the end and they usually need a little bit more time. Um, so I would say it's more likely in, in early June that there would be a study session. And then it gets approved. You know, let's say they have a couple changes that can usually be done pretty quickly and then it gets approved uh, late June. Sometimes it carries over into July if, if the changes are a little bit more detailed and take more calculations. Just to follow on that, is the study session before the city the presentation to the city council? And uh, is that, in your opinion, the best place where we as members of the Climate Action Committee would make our concerns known? Or is it possible prior to, to have comment with the finance department prior yeah. to that study session on Measure DD funds? So you're, this committee's role is to advise about what you'd like to recommend. I'd certainly work with that, but I just want to make that really clear. You're, you're not telling the finance director what to do. You're telling the city council what to do. Um, and so, yes, the city council study session would be the place to do that. Yeah, well, I, I fully appreciate our, uh, what our charge is to advise the city council, but it's very difficult to do the job at the very last minute when you get the information during a city council meeting. So all I'm saying is, could this information transfer happen? So at least we knew what the financiers were thinking about the, I mean, that's what we're trying to figure out now. Are all those funds gonna be available for cap use? Are they not? When will we find that out? Um, if it's possible to find it out sooner, yes, please. Um, it would be great to have that if you could be a conduit of that information. I, I will, I'll be a conduit as much as I possibly can. I can't ask the finance director to, to release a document that she's not prepared to release to the city council. Um, and, and I know that she once she has something that she feels is like is baked enough that it's ready for public, the public, I, I, you know, the city council is usually a place that finance directors take their work. Um, there is a new financial advisory committee I don't think it's even been seated yet, so I don't know what their role is going to be in this particular case. Um, but it, if, if past practice is anything, the second it gets developed to the point where all the numbers are adding up, um, or or it's clear that they're not adding up, and and they're, it's clear what the policy decisions are, that's when it goes to city council as quickly as possible. Um, I'll keep you in the loop. We can keep this as a standing agenda item for the next couple of meetings, just so you're not surprised. Um, but ultimately, and I think that's why it would be worthwhile for you to have a kind of a game plan, even without knowing what the numbers are, have a game plan of like, here are the three things that you really would be to this committee, you would be recommending and whether it's 200,000 or 400,000 or whatever the number is, if you have those ideas in place sooner rather than later, I think you'll be more successful in advocating. Yeah, so I guess my proposal would be, uh, I don't think it would be super beneficial to have a much more prolonged discussion on this particular item. Um, it might be worth sort of just revisiting this during our next meeting uh, after reviewing the cap and having a more thorough discussion on actual things that we feel like we should prioritize. And then we can sort of use that as a starting point for any future um, sort of discussions on this topic. Uh, how do you guys feel about that? Yeah, I think the, the work plan is really what we need to get to. Um, so. Okay, we'll, we'll 
be prepared to talk more next month. All right, back to you, Chair Choi. Um, okay, should we make a motion to add that to the next meeting's agenda or can we just move on? I made a note of it um, and we can make sure to record it under requests for future agenda items. So yeah, I, I don't think we need a motion, but thanks for checking. Okay, um, next we have item 6-4, the Climate Action Committee Work Plan for 2021. Awesome. Um, so I'll give a quick um, update and then um, we can dive into discussing the work plan. Um, but I wanna thank everyone for providing feedback at the last meeting on the work plan items, what everyone's priorities are. It's always fascinating to see what everyone wants to work on and what ideas are out there. Um, I listened to the CAC meeting again um, and considered comments that had been made about what committee members would like to put in a work plan. And I tried to incorporate that into a work plan in a way, and I apologize if I didn't achieve this um, perfectly, but I tried to incorporate it in a way that um, items weren't hyper-specific, um, but had a little bit more, I guess vague isn't the right word, but I tried to make statements more broad than specific, both to reduce the number of bullet points and allow for some flexibility um, for the committee in case uh, an item that a committee wanted to work on, say, for example, around electric vehicles. I didn't wanna keep it so hyper-specific, so that was the thing that was on the work plan, but instead it was a general statement about promote electric vehicle adoption, so the committee has some flexibility to decide how they wanna do that. Um, I also apologize for those who made recommendations for things to add to the work plan that were not added. Um, I didn't add items that did not fall under the purview of the Climate Action Committee's um, council defined purpose. Um, there were a few items in there that were clearly under the purview of other city commissions and committees. Uh, and it is important that we ensure that we're not um, I guess getting involved in someone else's jurisdiction because it could both be potentially a waste of time because ultimately one commission has the charge to work on a project um, versus the CAC having that charge. And also it is important that folks who are appointed to specific commissions to work under a specific purview have the opportunity to exercise that, um, that charge. Uh, so not all things that were mentioned at the last meeting were incorporated. Um, and I again, apologize for that, but I tried to use my best judgment to adjust items and then put things in the work plan that we know we have the ability to tackle, um, both because it's under the purview of the committee and is uh, feasible. With that being said, we also got submissions of work plans from other committee members, both uh, prior to the last discussion and um, in between our two meetings. So there were many attachments. Our proposal for this evening uh, to figure out how we can do uh, this work plan, uh, start to come up with more of a final draft is if the committee wants to pick one of those work plans that were listed as an attachment as a starting point and then we can share that work plan up on the screen and we can go line by line and discuss each item um, and we can do that as as quickly uh, we could quickly go through items and say yes or adjust this word or remove this item um, we can do that with, I look to the chair and the vice chair to help facilitate that too. Um, but that's our proposal for tonight. We pick one work plan to use as a base and then we can go line by line on that work plan. Any things that come up, Michelle will also be taking notes um, on new things that may come up. We'll track that on a different document and then we can switch to that different document and look at those new work plan items on that document. I'm not sure if I described that super well. Uh, so Jeff and Michelle, feel free to clarify anything <laughs> or those questions on what I just proposed. Um, please ask me questions 
And then before we do dive into a discussion, we probably should take public comment and then start diving in um, from there. So any questions on that approach? Um, or I guess thoughts on that approach really first. Committee member Peterson. Yeah, so um, I, I really appreciate how um, much time you put into this and creating it. So um, my intent in this was actually to try to keep some continuity uh, with the past four years of what's been happening with the development of the CAP and moving to the CAP 2 or the CAAP. And that we spent a lot of time in December, at, you know, after December 2019, when the council approved uh, the new CAP, uh, we spent a lot of time in, in early 2020, I guess it was, um, prioritizing, uh, and, and maybe it was even before that, I can't remember, but we, we did come up with priorities and we did come up with where we want to focus energy and we all agreed at the time that these that the three essential areas that we focus on were the ones that were going to provide the best results with the least you know with the, um, being efficient with our efforts. So I just wanted to kind of plead the case for um, the draft plan of you know that I eventually ended up with. It's sort of put in that order, and I'd like to at least have the opportunity to present that to the rest of the committee. So they understood what the point of that was. Uh, one process question. It is currently 920. I believe that our meeting ends at 930. Uh, so I would like to before the motion to extend the meeting to 10 p.m. Second. All right, roll call vote. Committee member Breeding? Nay. Vice Chair Chen? Aye. Committee member Larson? Yes. Committee member Merchant? Yes. Committee member Peterson? Yes. Committee member Woolley? Yes. Chair Choi? Yes. Okay, um, it was a majority, so motion to extend the meeting to 10 p.m. carries. I guess um, I'll just circle back. If there are no other questions, maybe we should open the floor to public comment and then the committee can dive in. So any members of the public who would like to speak on this item, raise your hand, please. I'll give you five more seconds. Okay, we're closing public comment. Back to the committee for discussion. Um, so the first, the first thing I guess we proposed is if the committee wants to take the approach that we're proposing, um, together discuss a work plan that you would like to use as a base document from the attached work plans on the agenda. And then we will, I will share the screen and we'll go down line by line. And Michelle will take notes of new items or comments that come up and we'll table those, come back to them and we'll discuss the current items on that work plan. So I, I have a question to all the, all the other members here. Have you all looked at all of these carefully? Has everybody read through the, I mean, this actually has like um, the council strategic plan, climate action committee work plan from 2019 through 2021, two drafts of which one I did, um, some comments from Eric, the public comments, which were hugely extensive and um, this this report on the um, advisory bodies did did everyone absorb all that? I, I'm just kind of curious because I spent a lot of time trying to do that. I'm just curious if everybody else did. Yeah, 
Yeah, I read through. Okay, I'm, I'm just not sure if it was, it, it was kind of monumental task. They absorbed everything. <laughs> it's like, did I absorb the city work plan? Probably not. I mean, you know, the, I mean, the uh, strategic plan, I, I read through it. So, you know, I got the, you know, I was looking for what applies to us. So, yeah. Yeah, well, just to, to follow that on, I, I am more than happy to go along with what um, Lizzie has suggested, but I wouldn't want to do it by looking at the 2019 to 2021 um, Climate Action Committee work plan because it's over. And there's no point in looking at that. It's past history. Um, what I'm arguing towards is, is we look at the one I put effort into putting together and um, can compare it back to the one Lizzie put together in case anybody had some questions about why it changed. And I can certainly give a complete explanation of how it's organized and why, which I think are important. So if people are in agreement to that, I mean, I don't wanna take over the meeting or anything. It's just, if, if there are other approaches people wanna entertain, I'm more than happy to hear it. I, th I think one thing I'm curious about is what Lizzie was describing is in terms of how hers was more general and Nick, yours is much more granular and which one is sort of the approach that we wanna go with and does, is it good for us to have like very specific identified goals in mind or is it better to have some, just, just based on the experience of past committee members? So I think that that sort of will dictate what I think is the better one to start with, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, there's Eric and I, and I've got four years, Eric has two. Yeah. So we could certainly speak to that. I, I would question whether, well, anyway, I, I think we can, I think there's a, a problem with being too vague and not having, you know, just having very generalized, you know, words like consider or investigate or um, study. These are all things that aren't, you know, aren't in my mind, after all my experience, leading to much accomplishment and actually diminishing um, emissions. We've got funding now, we have some very specific areas that we wanna focus on and we can do something now. So in that sense, um, I think we can be a little bit more specific on what we're gonna focus on if we're gonna accomplish things. And we can only accomplish so much as Jeff has pointed out, we've got in the next two years, we'll have 20 meetings and we will, there, there's a certain amount if we're gonna, I, I just don't wanna fritter it away on studying stuff or, or putting together things that aren't going to accomplish goals. Chair Choi, I'll defer to you to call on folks just um, that way Michelle and I can look at the documents too. Committee, committee member Larson. Yeah, to, um, to your question, <clears throat> what I've seen over the last two years that I've been on the committee is um, that we it feels like we want to have work plan objectives that are just broad enough that we don't have to define everything today because we don't know exactly how we'll implement some of the stuff. But I agree with Nick and we want to avoid the language that is just, you know, study or, you know, think about or whatever. I think we need to get more active um, language into the work plan so that we are committing ourselves to implementing and, and you know, getting some accomplishment done. Um, rather than creating a study or you know thinking about something, so that's what I am looking for is things that are just broad enough that gives us the wiggle room to figure out how to implement it later, but gives us some direction on on actually implementing something. And I guess I was thinking just a proposal. You know, Lizzie went to the did the you know, the the draft twenty one. 21, 23 work plan. So if we, and that's shorter, if we start with that, just look at what Lizzie did. We all understand what that says and then go to next because it's more comprehensive, has a lot more information in it. And, you know, we can kind of maybe take those two and then, you know, maybe next meeting, look at mine. Committee member Peterson. Yeah, I just have a suggestion. Yeah, I, I like what Eric suggested, but rather than going line by line, I think that eats up. I think what might be good is we look at Lizzie's, read it through, understand it, then we can look at how I've re essentially I reformatted Lizzie's 
And I could explain why I did that. And then I think that would resolve a lot of questions because there's a lot of similarity between the two. It's just, I, I just slightly reformatted it and, and brought back a couple things I thought were, were important. We can certainly talk about whether we shed those or not. So um, I'm just trying to think of an efficient way to do it. It'll be a little complicated to go line by line by line with all sorts of comments and public comment and other comments on, on uh, each line and try to finish in even the next 30 minutes. But I think if we just put it up, Lizzie can read through, explain her points, and then we could put mine up. I could explain my, you know, what I thought was why this is framing it in a more um, actionable manner. So I, I mean, I, either one will will work fine. It's just I I think there are a couple important things we need to keep in mind. Yeah, I guess reading between the two plans, a lot of the wording is almost identical. So I think it'd actually be useful maybe to just get a high level understanding of what's different between the two plans. They actually seem like very, 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 very similar to me. So uh, yeah, committee member Peters, and if you could maybe make like just some quick comments on um, what you think is missing from Lizzie's staff recommendation or uh, things that you would maybe like to incorporate from that. I think that'd be like pretty useful. Not to interrupt. I can also pull both up side by side if that's helpful. Um, and I also do want to say that um, I, I did get ex lots and lots of help from Michelle and Jeff. So I don't want to see it as my pro Lizzie's proposal. It's our, our staff recommendation, but yeah, that's that. what we should be saying as staff versus mine. Yeah. And but thank yes. you all. Great, great effort. I'll put um, both up. And I'll just start answering that. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely can't. The, the, the main task I did was I think we need to have, uh, I mean, there are a lot of important, you know, because we're addressing a very complex and very overwhelming issue of climate change and what to do. And I see other cities dealing with this. Um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot we need to accomplish in the next few years. And, and and you know the next five to ten years are really critical, and, and that makes the next two critical. So it's better to be more inclusive than exclusive. So what I did was I really looked at um, Lizzie's, and then I put it back together. First, making sure it was prioritized, and then making sure it held to the. I mean, the, the previous climate action committee did a lot of work going through the climate action plan, really thinking about. Um, I, I mean, the, I think Lizzie, you remember this, the priority, the prioritization sessions went on for three or four meetings. And we spent lots of amounts of time thinking and, and exploring. And we had members that were very knowledgeable in energy efficiency and energy policy and all sorts of things. And coming to a conclusion that there were three primary areas where we needed to focus our energies in order to have impact. First was building electrification. Second was zero emission trans transportation. And third was green infrastructure, especially tree, uh, increasing tree count and, and appropriate trees that provide shade throughout the city. So that has been recognized and I wanted, it, it was important to me as being someone that's been going along, trying to get this accomplished for four years that we not lose that emphasis. And I appreciate how staff tried to organize it more in kind of um, effort focused areas. But um, I think we lost the importance of certain things and then made more important other things that really we can let slide. And, and that, it was, that it would be really essential for us to put these. And I think we could actually debate, you know, is building electrification really more important than zero emission transportation? Aren't they the same? I mean, we could all debate that, but I think these top three that you see on the left are fine. And then when you get to the, the other ones, which in Lizzie's plan actually came up at the top, which I'm not, I don't think Lizzie, I'm sorry, I don't think staff was putting these in order of priority. These were just what we were going to accomplish. But I think it's important to have an order of priority because if we decide we want to either take them out or leave them there, but then just say, hey, we're okay with this because we understand the priority, it's important to have that in the work plan. So that, that's the main gist of, of what's there. And, and I actually also have in here 
where it specifically involves measure DD revenue, it's, it's stated so that we already have a, a jump on what Jeff has suggested, which is putting together these recommendations to city council on what the measure DD funds should be used for. In my mind, that is the most critical thing we have to accomplish because we really asked a lot of the voters, they're trusting us. And if we don't come through, uh, we won't be able to do another revenue measure ever to support climate change. So it, it, I saw that as, as the really high priority reasons for doing the structuring the way I did. I will really quickly say um, when we, at least when I took a first pass through during the work plan, um, I tried to be a little bit more vague about spending measure DD because I didn't want the committee to have already um, put themselves in that hole of where they think they're, the committee is going to spend measure DD because I know um, future conversations might evolve so just specifically on that note, that's where you might see some differences between me being a little bit more vague and committee member Peterson, Peterson's being a little bit more specific, um, just making that note. Yeah, and, I, and just to, a little bit on that, I fully understand that. I think staff is more timid on these issues because you know they have to be because they're balancing a whole slew of other things. I'm being very aggressive on this. I'll be just very upfront about this. This is critical. We have to fight for this. If we don't fight for it, nobody will. Um, you know, we, we've spent many years trying to impress this on people. We finally have some funds to do things. And I think we need to be very direct and explicit that we intend to do this. And, we, and, and I don't want to be wishy-washy or, 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 or soft or, or even polite about it. I think we should be very direct and directed so that we can get this out. Because I tell you, the second we, you know, when you're out there standing in front of the city council, they're gonna be city council and just go, well, I don't know. You know, the realtors aren't gonna be very happy about this. And, you know, the, I mean, you can't be wishy-washy in your original work plan or, or then you have nothing, I don't know. It just, to me, it's like the lessons I've learned in my last four years is you gotta you gotta really fight for what, what you wanna do. I mean, we. We've had all our successes doing that, of really pushing back, really pushing hard. And that's what's brought, brought things about. It, this, these are difficult things to have accomplished. People would prefer climate change just went away and we didn't even need to think about it. But, you know, I mean, I want, I want it to be treated as seriously. You know, when the police go in for $67,000 SUVs and they get them, I think that the Climate Action Committee should be able to go in and ask for measure D funds to do specific things and get it. So we need to be very explicit about that. Committee member Larson. Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I just was looking at, you know, given that, that topic, Lizzie, you did, our staff did put in, in the clean transportation and energy, you know, the first bullet point is advise council on allocating the spending measure DD. So, um, I, you know, I, I applaud and support that kind of, you know, effort as well. You know, that's so, uh, you're, you're, you're showing that you're not, the staff is, is willing to put that in there. That, that's, that's good. Can you yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess maybe circling back to um, uh, the original suggestion that uh, Lizzie made, uh, we've had you know, about 10 or 15 minutes of discussion on this, uh, would it be helpful to pick a plan as sort of a starting point? I would, I think it yeah, might- I'm gonna have Lizzie go through the staff plan and then Nick was gonna go through his plan. Oh, I see. I mean, I mean, can we, should, should we just start? Should we just- well, before, before I do that, I'm just kind of, you know, I just did a long presentation of why mine was the way it was. I'm just kind of curious what the other committee members think. I mean, do you agree? Do you disagree? Um, yeah, I want to say that, that I agree with what committee member Peterson has been saying, that it's, it's probably best that... Um, 
we're very aggressive in in our work plan and everything in there is very explicit and that um you know it's we're not going to get anything done if we don't come out at in the front and just say here's what we're going for and we're going to continue to 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 batter you the city council with this um time and time again so yeah i just wanted to 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 reiterate that and and throw my support behind that idea and just uh, just add on to that i really like how direct um nick's plan is and I think like personally, like something I wanted to prioritize was communication between AUSD and um, our committee. And I like how he just included that in the building electrification part. I think just being direct with what we want to communicate with them was just a nice touch. It may be me, I'm um, a little lost if we wanna pick one to look at and go line by line. Perhaps someone someone from the committee can make a proposal and we can vote if that's the best option for moving forward. You, you know, I, I think I can speak for staff. I, I, I'm picking up the sense that um, unless I'm, I'm missing something that you'd like to start with committee member Peterson's work plan and that's fine. We're, we're happy to go through that. Um, I, I don't think it's productive to have two different documents on the screen for long. Um, it's, you know, we got to get something done and we're probably not going to get it done tonight, of course, but, um, I, I just think pick one, let's get started on it. And, you know, um, that, if that's the one you're most comfortable with, great. Let's, let's get, let's dive right in. Okay. So we'll start with, can you remember Peterson's, sorry, the zoom bar, the top, sorry, give me one sec. Whenever I have the zoom bar at the top, it won't let me minimize things. Here we go. All right. Um, question for committee member Peterson, would you like me to read through line by line? Is that okay? Um, yeah, if you're, I mean, I'm totally happy to do it if, if you would prefer. I mean, I can comment. I mean, I think we just, let's just go through it. And then if people have questions, I can respond to that. Okay. Yeah, I, I think what our proposal is, it's, it's literally edit, you know, you could start with line A. Is there anyone have, a, have an edit to line A? If not, we move on. I don't think you necessarily need to have a discussion of every item unless a committee member wants to have that. Okay. Yeah, there's actually a, 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 an a intro to this that, that is kind of important that, um, you know, that this kind of captured back the um, earlier efforts of the prior Climate Action Committee and, and that the bolded, you know, items one, two, and three are priority. And this, and then also within this, there were certain issues that sort of overshadow everything, which is uh, ensuring equi equitable and fair um, consideration of vulnerable communities and then also making our efforts leverage off existing ones so we don't you know, reinvent the wheel when it already exists. So. Okay, awesome. I'll start with uh, 1A. Advise council on allocating and spending measure DD revenue in line with the goals of the cap, including providing financial incentives for building electrification, including multifamily and rental properties. Um, cool. I just a point of to clarify here, I can't see the gallery view and read this. So um, perhaps if committee or Vice Chair Chen and um, Chair Choi, if you can be the one to note if someone has their hand raised, I can't see. Okay. Recommend a new East Bay Community Energy default product to take effect in 2022 with an emphasis on the 100% renewable electricity option offered by EBCE and equity measures that will minimize impact on low income residents. Develop a program to electrify existing buildings and major appliances and increase access to electric vehicle charging, which may include point of sale requirements. Develop a process for the eventual elimination of the use of natural gas in new construction and major remodelings. 
engage AUSD in efforts to meet CAP goals and seek opportunities to engage Albany schools in sustainable energy and climate change mitigation actions. Uh, and the building electrification study for all city buildings. I think there was a comment. Yeah, I just want to say for E, I'm not sure that that necessarily fits under building electrification. It seems a little more general, um, just in terms of like the, everything else seems to be consistent with building, with electrification. Um, but that, that seems that it might intersect with other areas too. I can put that in our table document to come back to if we want. I think committee member Peterson might be speaking. On mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I can respond to that. So, um, you know, that's true, uh, but I think it's important to get that in there. The um, Albany Unified School District is probably the single largest power, electric power user and utility user in the city, um, short of the Department of Agriculture and um, Target, which has their own power system, they don't go through EDCE, and um, maybe University Village, and University has its own system. So really, the major work that's going to be done at uh, the schools is in building electrification. I could just see from the, like, the subcommittee meeting we had in different ways that we had within, you know, engaging people in the um, the website for reducing greenhouse gas emissions that there's other ways we might engage with the high school and I totally your point is really well taken I just was yeah thank you for clarifying that I was just wondering why it was under this specific topic header and not I, I think I, I definitely want to include it I just didn't know if it belongs under because I noticed that on the city one we have sort of a different like community engagement as its own topic and it kind of if, if it's a little more obviously under that but yeah, I realize that we, I, I, like the, I like the structure of it generally of the one that you have here, Nick. I just didn't see exactly how that one fit within it. That, well, that was how. I mean, I, what I was trying to focus on was more where, where are we getting the bang for the buck? Um, and I think that's where we'll get it. That makes uh, sense. Yeah. Uh, committee member Larson. Yeah, on um, <clears throat> one A, yeah. Do you consider panel upgrades um, and some sort of incentive or support for panel upgrades to buildings to be part of 1A? Um, sure, why not? Hi. Why not? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I know we've debated in the past about whether panel upgrades and you know incentivizing or supporting or rebates or whatever, you know, using DD funds for that kind of thing. It, we've debated about whether that's a good idea or not, but we may find that it is a good idea. And I just wanted to make sure that that was you know, within the scope of that, because it's, I mean, building electrification, I mean, so I just wanted to make sure that that was. Yeah, everything electrical in a building is under building electrification, including the panel. Um, so we're on E, are we leaving E here? Was that the consensus or are we moving it? I would opt for it staying unless someone says otherwise. I'm okay with it staying given Nick's explanation. Okay. All right. Um, F, initiate a building electrification. Oh, sorry, we covered that one. Um, now we're on zero emission transportation. Lizzie, do we want to open a space for people to add potential additions or other, like I have a document here for things that are kind of bigger discussions if we want to bring it up and table it or talk about it now. So just a moment if anyone wants to kind of add anything larger into section one. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Or change something. All right, doesn't sound like it, so go ahead, Lizzie. Cool. Zero Emission Transportation, advise council on allocating and spending Measure DD revenue in line with goals of the CAP, including providing financial incentives that decrease the number of internal combustion engine vehicle trips traveled and are equitable with a focus on renters and low income residents. Finalize and begin implementation of a zero emission transportation action plan. 
develop a pilot parking management permit pilot program to incentivize zero emission vehicles and to be coordinated to support existing residents in areas being targeted for higher density housing. I'm gonna take a pause here. Um, I did not include this in the staff document because it seems like it is under the purview of the Transportation Commission's um, charge, uh, their council defined role. Um, I'll defer to Jeff too, because he has more experience with that commission, but that is why I left this one off of the other version. I'm not sure what the implications are of, of including it are, Jeff. Um, th that's right. I think it would be a little awkward for this committee to develop a parking program for the city. Um, it, it would, I, I imagine this would be a topic of discussion when the city council reviews this work plan. Um, it's not that it's a bad idea. It's just, is this the place, is this something the climate action committee should be doing? And, um, if you do this, you won't get anything else done. <laughs> so let me just provide that, that context based on, on my experience. Um, this, will, this will absorb all of your time over the next two years if you choose to do it. Well, maybe a better way to do it is, um, I, you know, I hate using words like propose because you can propose and everyone will say no. So the idea is to put this forward because it has huge implications on incentivizing a switch to electrified transportation, huge. And when it's been brought up before, staff has always said, oh no, you don't wanna to touch that because it's the hot potato. But I wanna to touch it because I think it's essential to us making rapid um, uh, progress on getting any kind of um, traction in, in um, you know, transportation emissions. So we have an opportunity now because we are developing these high density districts and they're gonna happen. And people are very upset about the impact on parking. So there is actually, there will actually be support from uh, people who, who are, aren't normally gonna do the right thing to do the right thing and, and support a, uh, a uh, pilot project at least for that. So, you know, again, this is one of these things that I wanted to say we would more partner with, but I don't think transportation is motivated. I don't think planning is motivated. And so we have to put the motivation in there. So if you have another way of, of stating that, I'm more than happy to entertain it, but I think it's critical to Albany's success at um, getting to zero emission transportation in addressing the parking issue and parking uh, management. So um, this is probably another agenda item. I think we could go long and deep into parking. I, I disagree with the characterization of staff's position, not touching a hot potato. We touched this hot potato. We came to a conclusion a couple of years ago that it wasn't viable for the city. We're happy to reopen that anytime the city council wants us to. Um, and, and my main point here is to say, is this something the committee wants to work on? Um, as a, com a committee initiative. If you do, we can leave it in. Um, my recommendation and my expectation is the city council would look at that and say, yeah, this is a really good idea, but probably transportation should do it. Um, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Well, even if the council does that, that's a success because then they've, uh, they've tasked transportation with doing it. So I, I don't see where a city, a parking management plan is on the books like you said, it, it isn't feasible. I don't understand why it isn't feasible, but you say it isn't. So I'm putting it we, out there. I want to make it member, We did a study about four years ago on parking management, citywide parking management. We're happy to do it again. Yeah, I'm saying that maybe you need to take a phased look and do a pilot and then roll it out. But to, I agree, We're not, this isn't to roll it out over the whole city. This is maybe to roll it out on a few streets, see how it works out. Yeah, I, I think committee member Larson's. Oh, sorry, committee member Chen. I know. I think uh, committee member Larson is ahead of me. Well, I, I was going to say I was debating on this one because it's it's very specific and it feels like a decision about a program that we really haven't 
as a as a committee decided on yet. But I like the implementation part of it. I was thinking about this feels like it would be something that could come out of the zero emission transportation action plan, and it would be something that we would implement out of that. So I, you know, while I like the idea of this and I like the implementation, you know, push for it, I, I wonder if it's you know, I was debating, you know, like you said, Nick, it's, it's something that we, we will have to push for this to ha to make it happen. But whether we want to put this in a work plan is something that we're committing to this specific thing. It feels like there's other things that may come out of the zero emission transportation action plan that we decide to implement. I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, you could, you could literally just say, well, you know, kind of go under the radar. I, I, I just want to get people thinking about it. But I'm if people if the rest of the committee feels this is something that is exceeding our purview, and, you know, maybe we can at least come up with proposals for it out of the zero emission transportation plan. I'm not saying this one specifically would exceed our purview. I'm just saying, that's one very specific implementation that could be you know, if we keep it broad with the zero emission transportation plan that we're going to implement, then it gives us the ability to say, here's the one we have chosen and we want to push this. I'm just looking for other committee members to comments now. Uh, yeah, I was actually going to make a pretty similar point. Um, I think it is a little specific uh, and it sort of overlaps with uh, point B um, on the zero emission transportation action plan. I think you know, sort of uh, putting together an action plan for the transportation plan and then um, using that as an input into the transportation committee, I feel like that would maybe be a more productive way of moving that forward. So I'm hearing not include this, defer instead to the line item above, and the committee agrees that this will be something that will be explored in finalizing a zero emissions transportation plan. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'll, I'll um, find other ways to pursue it. So just before I click backspace, that's the, that's the committee consensus. Okay, cool. Um, as a point of procedure, um, we may want to extend the meeting. if that's something the committee wants to do. So what would give us another like 15 minutes? We do still have subcommittee updates um, to consider if the committee wants to keep that. Um, I have a feeling we'll need more than, than 15 minutes. Um, I, I suggest we push off this, unless somebody wants to do subcommittees, I'll, I don't have anything to report for mine. You know, the outreach subcommittee might have something to share this evening. I think I'm on that one. We we met, we could update, but we could also, I, I could, uh, I don't know how Eric and Graham feel, but we could save that for next time if we want to stay focused on the work plan. Yeah, I, agree. yeah, I, I think I agree with that one. We can wait till next time. Okay. Does someone have a motion? Sure, I'll move to uh, extend the meeting until 10, 15 p.m. I'll second. Okay. Um, committee member breeding. Absent. Committee member or vice chair Chen. Uh, I'll give that a yes, but I guess uh, my recommendation would be that we go through maybe one more section and then uh, we can sort of save the other two sections for the next meeting because I feel like we probably need to have another meeting to have this as one more agenda item one more time anyway. So uh, yeah, I'd say 15 minutes to cover another section totally makes sense to me. That's a yes. That's a yes. Great. Committee member Larson. I would say the same thing as Committee member Chen. Yes, but let's just do 15 more minutes and let's dedicate most of the next meeting to the work plan. 
Committee Member Merchant? Yes. Committee Member Peterson? Yeah, I agree, and we will stop after that. Committee Member Woolley? Yeah. Chair Choi? Yes. All right, motion carries. Let me pull up. Okay. So now we are on zero emission transportation C, initiate a fleet electrification study for all city vehicles. Green infrastructure. Develop a street tree planting program that uses Measure DD funds to promote street tree installation in order to promote shading and air quality improvement. Develop a community climate disaster resilience plan to address increased hot weather and air quality events. Okay. Uh, yeah, I uh, guess. Oh, sorry. Yeah, going back to, uh, I guess, 2D, the fleet electrification study. Um, I see how it's organized because we have this in two sections. I think it does really, 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 it has like a strong friend in 1F uh, yeah. for the building electrification for city buildings. Um, I'm a little hesitant to recommend combining them, but because I do think that they're two pretty distinct things. And I'm just kind of wondering though, like if we were to actually sequence this work, it would probably all occur in kind of one big work item, correct? My staff thought is uh, we began initiating a fleet electrification study with EBCE last year, um, just on a staff level, it just kind of got kicked off. Uh, it never got to a point where we brought it to the committee. It has been on pause uh, because of site visits were needed um, to continue work. And given the pandemic, we haven't been able to really do that. Um, so I guess my thought on committee or vice chair Chen what you're proposing is I see how it could be one item if we just do one big electrification study but it could potentially be two considering we've started piecing one of it out already so yeah just just some background to help with decision making uh committee member Peterson again this this speaks to first city leadership and then two to priority. So it's in, I think the electrification of city buildings would be more compelling and, um, you know, it's a, it's a difficult hurdle and we're asking other people to do it. So the city leads, right? And then um, the vehicle one gets kind of interesting. We, we also don't have a huge number of city vehicles. So it's not like we're, um, you know, San Francisco is somewhere tons of buses and other stuff. So um, it's, it, the impact probably isn't as huge. But um, anyway, I think it's good to keep them again in these priority categories and in the areas that we agreed we would focus on for clarity. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. So we are, oh, committee member merchant. No, it's not unmuted. For 3A, the street tree planting program, don't we already have a street tree planting program in Albany? Is this separate from the one that is run the Albany Urban Forest? There was some guy named, someone named John in the um, city, in City Hall. No? It's yes. totally non, non, I mean, it's, I've tried meeting with John it, it's not a very open and engaging plan and it doesn't seem to accomplish. I mean, they planted a few trees, but it's not, it, it, we need to do a lot more. So this is sort of accelerating that. We've talked about this before. There's no map of all the trees in the city. There's no assessment, you know, it's stuff we need to do. And, and there's issues about what kind of trees should be where. And we have certain trees that are, that they're planting, which are way too small to provide, um, heat island protection. Um, they are more planted because they won't go up into the telephone lines or something like that. So it, it isn't really coordinated with green infrastructure per se. It's just sort of like a tree maintenance um, program. Okay. 
our climate action plan, action 4.1.1, is to develop an urban forestry master plan. Um, and I think that I'm wondering, committee member Peterson, if that is what this um, item is trying to get at versus developing the street tree program. It's more developing a street tree plan right. implementation program. Right, and that, that could actually, um, rather than say street tree, just, you know, could drop street. Um, but I, I want to get away from that we're expecting, this, this is on public lands. So it could be parks along streets um, and not so much expecting private parties just to plant trees on their property. I think that the city, I mean, the, 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 the heat islands are really the streets and the areas where that happens and that's what you want shading over. So um, it was to improve that. Should we change it from tree planting program to urban forestry? Sure. I'm okay with that, sure. Just, just so I understand this, are you proposing to use Measure DD funds to, you know, buy and plant trees, or? That, yeah, exactly. That's one of the things that, again, each. So we will take the ones that have the Measure DD in them, and we'll expand them out with budgets and everything, and then we can come back and show here's how we want to use the funds. And one of the uses was to, to even you know, get more aggressive in providing trees, providing um, labor and other things to uh, get the trees installed and actually, you know, actually promote with, you know, actually meet with people on streets that are, are lacking trees and get them to agree to put trees in. That all takes a lot of time and effort. And we could, the idea would be to both have volunteers, but then, have materials supplied by Measure DD funds. Okay. So should we change the wording? Oh, committee member Larson. I was gonna say, um, should we change the wording so that we're clarifying that it's not addressing the current street tree program, but a different kind of program? Yeah, I would take street out. So does this red writing look good to the committee? Uh, I would suggest that we sort of uh, parallel the other measure DD um, items. Uh, so rather than develop an urban stream program, like advise council on developing an urban forestry program, I kind of suspect that out of all of these three different measure DD things, you know, we might be able to get one or two of them. So it's sort of like, I think that our job as the committee is to provide, you know, these different options and then sort of allow council to make the final decision. So it'd be advise council on developing an urban forestry program. That looks good to me. Yeah, um, question for Jeff. So here's another overlap with um, parks and recs an open space. Um, we, again, it says promote street tree installations. Maybe we just say promote tree installation. I don't know, is there a concern, Jeff, about that? Um, if you were preparing a plan that would probably be developed collaboratively with the Parks and Open Space Commission, but if it's just a program, I don't, I don't have a problem with what you're proposing here. Great, thanks. Okay. So are we good with this item? Then we are at develop a community climate disaster resilience plan to address increased hot weather and air quality events. Just one, one last thing, Lizzie, did, did in um, A, is it still okay to say the DD funds are to promote street tree installation or do we just wanna say tree? Be a little bit more vague on that. And it could be trees in a park. It could be trees we give to people to plant at their houses or it could be street trees. So just get rid of the word tree. 
that work for the committee? Yeah, I think you could just get rid of um, that whole part. Uh, just, so if you just said develop an urban forestry program that uses measure DD funds in order to promote shading and air quality improvement. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, like the, I like the trees still being in there. <laughs> My personal feeling. Okay. Thoughts from others? Yep, it's fine. So leave it. Okay. Now we're on 3B, develop a community climate disaster resilience plan to address increased hot weather and air quality events. Probably the same comment that committee member Chen made that this is really more <clears throat> advising council on developing. Does the committee agree? Well, isn't um, all of this is where, like, if you go back up to 1D, um, you know, we have to put advice counsel in front of everything. Um, I mean, that's what we do as advice counsel. So, I, maybe it was more important to have those in front of the ones that said measure DD, you know, because that that's um, highlighting that those funds are are what we're really concerned about. So I don't know. I mean, we could put advice council in front of everything. Sure. So change it back, develop. Yeah, I kind of like the original wording. Uh, I guess the distinction I see is that for measure DD funding, I see that more as like directly a city council decision between several priorities that we specify. Whereas, you know, something like a community climate disaster resilience plan is more something that the committee directly works on. Okay. Um, just, just for the committee's information, um, no problem with what you're proposing here. There is a federally ma mandated report that we do about every five years. It's called the Hazard Mitigation Plan. And I think we're next due to do that and due to be submitted in 2023, mm -hmm. um, which may be kind of the same thing. So um, I'm, I'm just not sure. This is, I, I think, pretty low on your prioritization and um, which is probably okay because they, they may be one in the same. Community member Peterson. Yeah, thank you. So that's a that's a good point. And the reason, actually, the reason I threw in disaster wasn't so much as disaster preparedness and hazard response, which is, I I realize that's a whole nother kind of category. But that, and maybe this is you know that a lot of cities like Berkeley are declaring that there's a climate disaster happening now and that we can use certain powers as a jurisdiction to enforce certain things more rigorously because we're in a disaster situation now. It's not that it's gonna, it's a pending disaster, it's a current disaster. So I don't know if that word disaster has kind of muddied, muddied the waters, but that was the intent of, um, and, and maybe it should say develop a community climate change resilience plan instead of climate disaster. Would that be similar to our climate action plan though? Well, I, again, this is maybe something member Chen can speak to because I think this came from one of his suggestions to actually focus on resilience and um, have things that were, you know, not emissions reducing, but resilience important. Right. And also, I'm going to interject real quick, we should extend the meeting, um, because it is 1014. Just so we can have a few minutes to wrap up. Um, could, could we just say, well, that's it for now, just wrap up now. We know what where we'll come back. 
I don't know if committee vice chair Chen was crafting a response in his head. Um, uh, no, I think this is actually a pretty good place to, um, you know, sort of leave things for now. Uh, I'm actually super excited about how far we've gotten on the work plan. Um, yeah, I really love the discussion we had today. Um, so yeah, really appreciate, uh, you know, this, this went um, really, really well from my perspective. <laughs> Great. And so um, to clarify, we're, we're stopping 6-4 now. We're skipping over 6-5. Um, we do have call for future agenda items, but as long as there's nothing new, I think we have a pretty good sense of um, what will be on the next agenda based on feedback from this evening. I do just want to quickly check and see if we have any public comment before we wrap up. Giving it a couple seconds. Okay, back to you, Chair Choi. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>